subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates the ascendant quran an advanced english translation of the meanings of the quran i want to get into specific examples uh, in uh, the translation as well as in the tafsir that that you've been working on one aspect that i personally of course was struck by this ayat in the quran uh, ya ayyuhal ladina amanu every english translation that i have come across says o oh, you who believe but you have moved away from this you have in fact given a um, a very beautiful explanation of this ayat uh, i want you to please uh, elaborate on this as well as the related aspect uh, in in your particular tafsir and the translation that you have done um you also emphasize repeatedly on allah's power and authority so please elaborate on both of them the the, uh, the ayah or the pa- part of the ayah ya ayyuhal ladina amanu and the importance of recognizing allah's power and authority that regrettably is not uh, highlighted properly in other translations excellent questions and this goes to the heart of the matter and this is what distinguishes this translation from the others and hopefully in a very positive and complimentary way not in any confrontational or antagonistic way <clears throat> it, as i said in the in the initial remark that i'm in the first remark that i made the translations are that we have in the english language they are full of terminology that belongs to biblical literature unfortunately we the muslims have not taken control of the non arabic language in this case english we have not taken control of the language and then molded words or even invented words this is what has to be done you know languages they have the capacity to um absorb new words you'll find in the english language there's latin words there's french words there's german words all of these have been absorbed into uh these languages we the muslims have not had any contribution uh, in we ourselves introducing some of our own terminology into the english language there are some islamic words in the english language but they came into the english language not because we the muslims propelled them into the language it's because some orientalist or some academic or some uh politician or whoever thought okay let's use this word in the english language one of these words is kafir or it's mispronounced in i guess some areas in africa as they say kafir or something like that so they give it their own twist they bring it into the language they give it their own twist and then uh we are supposed to be con- we the muslims who are supposed to know better we become consumers of their words and their words are second fiddle to their thoughts and their thoughts are in the service of their imperialism and their zionism so we are actually when by the choice of our words we are liberating ourselves from their their dictionary definitions of certain words and this is where we we come to ya ayyuhal ladina amanu Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu if you follow this word in the Quran in the over uh, this phrase if you follow it in the Quran in the overwhelming majority of cases there is a responsibility or an assignment that follows that Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu uh, we're in Ramadan right now Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyam kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kunu qawwamin bil qist shuhada lillah Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu 
كتب عليكم القتال يا ايها الذين امنوا قوا انفسكم يا every sentence that follows يا ايها الذين امنوا carries with it a responsibility and a task when when someone is translating ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu as o you who believe someone who believes does not necessarily that does not rest necessarily translate to a deed or an action i can believe in something but that doesn't mean i have to do that type of thing but when allah is saying ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu he is he is coupling that with a following effort that we are supposed to if it's an obedience if if it's something to do we will do it if it's something to avoid we will avoid it and the word am mu'minin or alladhina amanu this word is taken from an ayah in the quran uh, uh, the understanding of this word and its translation into english is taken from an ayah in the quran i think it's ayah number 82 in surah al-an'am alladhina amanu wa lam yalbisu imanahum bi dhulm ulaika lahum al-amn wa hum muhtadun so allah is right now giving us the definition of alladhina amanu they are the ones who have not contaminated their commitment to allah with zulm with injustice wrongdoing or oppression ulaika lahum al am in the ayah they are the one ones who secure Allah's safety ulaika lahum al-amn wa hum muhtadun they are the ones who are guided so we have the word security that defines alladhina amanu and then we go to the prophet is a hadith by Allah's prophet may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his in this hadith the prophet says la imana liman la amanata lah a person who cannot be trusted does not have iman so if you combine the word trust and you combine the word security you come you come out with the with the expression in the english language o oh, you who are firmly or securely committed to allah or in short o oh, you who are committed to allah this element of commitment dovetails with and i'm not trying to here justify it but just for your information it dovetails with the original word that was used in pre-islamic scriptural history the prophets of the abrahamic prophets they use the word covenant i chose not to use the word covenant rather to use the word commitment even though they are very similar in their scriptural and practical meanings but because of our history and uh, our meaning our islamic history with people of scripture we extended our hand to them and they more or less slapped our extended hand so they didn't want to have any commonality or any common grounds between us and them okay fine you have your way and we'll have our way you have your choice of words we will have our choice of words lakum dinukum wa liya din so that had that that has to do with why we use the word o oh, you who are committed to allah and not the word o oh, you who believe 
I'm sorry, Brother Zafar, what was the second question about? Second question was with respect to Allah's power and authority. Uh, yes. You have highlighted in both in your tafsir as well as in this translation. Excellent question. It's so excellent that uh, it skipped my mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has Asma'ullahi al-Husna wa lillahi al-Asma'ul Husna. These are around 100 descriptions and attributes of Allah Jalla Jalaluh. And when you look at these attributes, the gracious, the most merciful, the compassionate, the all-knowing, the all-hearing, the all-seeing, the subtle, the, the most endearing, etc., etc. All of these attributes of Allah, you can encounter an average Muslim and you can encounter an average non-Muslim in their own understanding or in their own definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't argue with you. No one, no one takes issue with this. Everyone succumbs to it. They say, yes, God is oft forgiving. God is nearer to us than anything else. And so all of these attributes, there's no quibble about. There, but when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his uh, attribute as al-adl, the just, Allah's attribute as al-qawi, al-qadir, al-muqtadir. Allah's attribute as al-hakim. There are these attributes that specifically give us the unmistakable meaning that Allah has immediate authority and he has prevailing power. These are meanings that are omitted from our understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In many cases, this factors in very significantly when we are speaking about power and wealth. Power and wealth have become deities unto themselves. Whoever has power in this world, I'm speaking about, I'm not speaking about in an Islamic construct of life. I'm speaking about in the crass materialistic world that we, you and I and everyone else shares today, here and now. Those who have power, military power, soft power, whatever type of power you want to refer to it, those who have this type of power, even though they don't say that they are gods, but just because they wield the power the way they do, they are playing the role of gods in our lives. They don't tell you and me, I'm a god. Has anyone heard of uh, a certain president or king or military general or has anyone heard of any of them come and say, but I'm God. It's the God that you are worshiping up there in heaven. Well, you know, uh, you have the freedom to entertain your own mythologies and your own superstitions. That's you're right. But, you know, I'm your God. No one says that. It's not what they say. It's what they do that counts. They act like gods, and therefore, by acting as gods, they are display. Or they are trying to displace Allah, Azza wa Jal, from our conscience, from our minds, from our emotions, from our daily life. Allah has been for for, for practical purposes. Allah cannot. You, you cannot marginalize Allah. But in the materialistic world that people are, are beholden to, in that materialistic world, these have become the gods. So this also 
enhances our understanding of our own shahada, our article of faith, as it is called. When we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, when we profess, when we confess to this meaning, that means we are prioritizing Allah's power and Allah's authority in our life, in everything that we do. But we don't, this, this attribute of Allah is absent. Why? Because for all practical reasons and purposes, we have been secularized. Even though, you know, many of us, we perform our rituals. I mean, some of us, we pray five times a day. We pray our voluntary uh, nawafil during the night. We fast Ramadan. We fast extra days during the year on a Monday and on a Thursday and on Ayam at Tashriq, the mid uh, lunar the middays of the lunar month, and we do all of this, you know, we pay the 2.5% zakah, and we go to hajj, and everything, you know. But when it comes to Allah's authority, when it comes to Allah's power, he's absent. He's not absent in the real sense of the word. He's absent in our conceptual uh, sense of the word. No one factors in Allah. As let's say you're a husband in your family and a husband is the power center of the family because of, you know, physical stuff and because of responsibilities in this. So let's take a husband here. We're not going to deal right now at this moment, even though in the tafsir of the ascendant Quran, the tafsir, we, we dwell on this at length. But to simplify it, instead of going out into a very complex world with politics and ideology and philosophies and militaries and economies. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll simplify it. Just come to the family. In the family, when a husband or a father, when they use their power to subdue their wife or their children, they do that with the absence of Allah. They did not factor into their conscience, their mind, and their heart that Allah's power is right here and now. Allah's authority is going to take its course. So I better be careful as a husband and a wife, I mean, as a husband and a father. I have to be careful with the relative. It's only relative with the relative power that I have. If I am conscious that Allah lives in me, lives with me, lives inside of my heart, inside of my muscles, inside of my brain, inside of my action, if I am aware of that, then I'll think twice before I abuse power. Now, if this applies on a on the scale of a family, it also applies on the scale of humanity. And if we can adjust this, if we can, that's why some people, and I, I've received this comment from some very concerned and very sincere readers and followers of the Ascendant Quran, it, the tafsir there. And they say, well, I mean, isn't it obvious that Allah is an authority and a power. I said, in the abstract world, yeah, it's obvious. No one, you know, is going to, in their right mind, I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule, but no one's going to argue that because one of the attributes, and it's used even in, in biblical language, almighty, the almighty, almighty God. That, But they say that, but when it comes to the real world, almighty Allah, almighty God is not there because they keep on doing what they do. Why do the people who are uh, uh, killing, the people right now who are running and controlling and uh, deconstructing, I dare say, destroying Mecca and Medina, 
these people, they went to war with the poorest people in the world in Yemen. Did they do that when Allah, his power presence is in their mind and his authority is in their mind? Did they do that? Can someone do that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is circulating in their thoughts? It can't be done. So this absent reality has to become stark, uh, obvious for those who are reading the meanings of these ayat. So Allah Jalla Sha'nuhu uh, elevated is his affair. Allah Jalla Sha'nuhu has to be reconscientized, if I can use that construct. He has to be reconscientized in us. He can't remain this abstract, you know, oh, Allah is, you know, yeah, yeah, we you know, don't, don't read. This is, the, this is the refrain. You, oh, you don't have to remind me of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he's the authority and he's the most powerful. No. Okay. If you know that, then why are you abusing the power that you have? Don't you know that this power is Allah's power? They don't know these things. Why do you promulgate laws contradictory to Allah's moral laws? We, we have our understanding of Allah and his prophet is we are moralizing our laws and we are legalizing our morality. And this can only be done when we acquiesce to Allah's immediate authority and his preponderance of power. And that's why you will you will see this repeated many times. It's not meant just to fill in words or to expand a sentence or anything like that. It is meant for us to honor Allah in His quintessence of attributes, and that His that is His power and His authority here on earth as it is in heaven. The ascendant Quran an advanced English translation of the meanings of the Qur'an.